For our time of pastoral prayer this morning, uh, I want to again draw your attention to our Advent uh, guides that we have uh, put together. Um, as we go through the Advent season, as we, as we work our way toward Christmas, uh, many of us, especially those of you who have children, will be doing something each evening. We have a book that my family has been reading for years. And we actually have purchased a copy of that book for each of our kids in the hopes that they will in turn pass that along, that pass that tradition along, that studying of God's word together each night during Advent. And I want to encourage each of you that, um, that have got these guides. If you haven't got one yet, please make sure that you, you pick one up. But uh, the book is, has been prepared in such a way to lead us to Christmas. We'll see as you read uh, that a promise was needed promise was made, a promise was expected, and a promise has been kept. And the devotions have been organized in such a way to help lead us to Christmas. So I encourage you to, to, to use your Advent guide daily. There's a hymn that has been uh, suggested for you to sing uh, as you go through uh, each of those areas to, to think about the coming of Christ and to think about what it means for Christ to come. And I encourage you each to do that uh, through the Advent season, and I encourage you to make that part of your uh, evening uh, Advent uh, celebration with your, your kids. Okay, so let's uh, go to the Lord in prayer, and as we do that, I'm going to pray the Lord's blessing upon us, and um, I'm going to pray that he continues to prepare our hearts and uses our Advent guide to do that as we get into the Advent season. Please join me in prayer. Lord God, we thank you and we praise you for this day, and we thank you, Lord, for hymns of praise that we can sing to you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your word becoming flesh and dwelling among us, Lord. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. And Lord God, we know that through this season that there will be many things that we enjoy, many things that could be distractions, Lord, but we pray that we would never lose sight, that we would never lose focus, that the entire reason that we're celebrating through the Advent season, that through, through the Christmas season, we're celebrating the coming of your son, Jesus Christ. And Lord God, we, we want to make sure that we are focused on that. We want to make sure that we never, ever lose sight of that, Lord. And we pray that we would pass that on to our family, that encouragement to remember that Christ is the, re the reason for Christmas, that Christ is the best gift that was ever given, and that we are to teach our children and teach our families to love Christ and to know him as their Lord and Savior. Lord God, we pray that, that as we have prepared this Advent um, devotional guide, Lord, we pray that it would be a blessing to those who read it. We pray that as uh, we read and we get to hear from many people in the church, Lord, we pray that there is one common theme, and that common theme is that we love you and that we love your son, Jesus Christ. And we want to focus on him. We want to see, Lord, how you have worked through all of your scripture, pointing us to the time when Christ would come. And then from the point that Christ ascended to be with you, Lord, that we are now focused on his return. And we pray, Lord, that through this Advent season that we would be finding our joy, finding our peace in your son, Jesus Christ. So, Lord, we pray that you would bless us through this Advent season. We pray that this devotional would be a blessing to each and every one of us, and we pray, Lord, that we would continue to focus solely on you. We thank you and praise you for your son. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. If you would, turn to the Bible to Revelation chapter 19. Revelation chapter 19. Now, we, we told you last Sunday that we're going to take a break from Revelation. We've been in it for a long time. We're, this is going to be our last uh, Sunday in Revelation for this year. Next Sunday, we will start the Advent, and we're going to preach through the, the theme of that Advent guide, uh, and that will take us all the way into January of 2023. And today seems like a good stopping point as we have finally made it to chapter 19 of Revelation. I want to ask you this morning, when was the last time that you were really, really happy? When was the last time that you rejoiced, that you celebrated something, that you were just overwhelmed, filled with smiling and goodness and rejoicing? That's a real state. People 
get like that. But when was the last time you were like that? This past week, I found myself in a middle school basketball game. Not even the varsity middle school basketball game. A seventh grade junior varsity middle school basketball game. I went there thinking I'm not going to be jumping up and down or cheering or yelling or anything. But the team that was down by 14 points at halftime had come back to tie it in the final 10 seconds. Forced a turnover and we had the ball with five seconds left tied. And one of our guys got fouled with no time on the clock. It's like storybook type stuff. And he went to the foul line with zeros on the clock, tie game. And when they do that, the players don't even stand in the, on the blocks. They're, they're at half court. If he makes it, we win. If he misses it, it goes to overtime. He missed the first. And the nerves were getting higher and higher. But he made the second free throw, and we won on the road. And I, you would have thought that I was at the final four. I was standing in the bleachers, and I was jumping up and down, and I was cheering. And it wasn't my son <laughs> that even did that. It was just some other kid. And I was just so happy for Lasseter Middle School and for the team and for the victory and all of that. And in that little moment, I loved it. I was rejoicing. I was yelling and cheering and clapping and high-fiving players and giving hugs to the players as they came out of the locker room. And The Bible teaches us that that day is coming eternally. Chapter 19 is about the rejoicing in heaven. Now, I know that last week was a really, really heavy passage, and we looked at 17 and 18 together just because it was so heavy. But I told you last week that 17, 18, and 19 go together. And so what we're going to see today, this rejoicing on heaven, is supposed to be coupled with the judgment of the wrath of God on Babylon, the world, the lost, evil, sin. But it goes together. And so hopefully what we saw last week combined with what we see today will pull it all together. Read with me, if you will, from Revelation chapter 19. Today we're going to look at the first 10 verses. After this, I heard what seemed to be the loud voice of a great multitude in heaven crying out, Hallelujah. Salvation and glory and power belong to our God, for his judgments are true and just. For he has judged the great prostitute who corrupted the earth with her immorality and has avenged on her the blood of his servants. Once more they cried out, Hallelujah, the smoke from her goes up forever and ever. And the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God who was seated on the throne saying, Amen, Hallelujah. And from the throne came a voice saying, Praise our God, all you his servants, you who fear him small and great. Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder crying out, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with, with fine linen, bright and pure, for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. Then I fell down at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, you must not do that. I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. What a scene. The beginning of chapter 19 is the rejoicing in heaven at the end of the world and the salvation that all those who hope in Christ will experience. The word hallelujah, which means praise the Lord, is found throughout this passage. You saw that. And once again, I want to thank and praise uh, Andrew Crawford for the excellent job he does. Y'all have seen that the theme of the songs today was hallelujah, right? And the reason why is because he's prepared well and he's looked at the Bible and he sees that our passage today has a lot of hallelujah in it. So our songs today had a lot of hallelujah in it. That is good leadership. That is good pastoring from the music side of a worship service. Thank you for that, Andrew. This is a beautiful scene. And it goes along with the judgment of God at the end of the world. 
The Bible often uses the phrase, on that day. And on that day, there will be some who are judged, and there will be some that rejoice. Chapter 19 shows us the rejoicing. I want us to see four points today, four ideas coming out of this. Number one, and all of them are about the rejoicing in heaven, okay? All of them are about the rejoicing in heaven. Number one, in heaven, God is worshipped for his justice. In heaven, God is worshipped for his justice. Justice has become a hot topic in our world these days, and we know that. And the reason why is because we are familiar with so many injustices. So many things that we say, that ain't right, that's not good, it shouldn't be that way, that's not fair. They shouldn't be doing that. And the Bible wants us to see here that God is just, and in that final day in heaven, he will be worshipped because he is so masterfully, beautifully, royally, in a holy way, just. The first five verses point to this. First of all, it's, a amazing, it's an amazing scene. It is loud voices crying out. It is a great multitude in heaven. It's a number that nobody can count, and they are praising God. They're saying hallelujah. They're saying salvation. They're saying glory. They're saying power. These things belong to God. God, you are worthy, holy, holy, holy. This is the song that comes out of heaven. But verse 2 shows us specifically that his judgments are true and just. God doesn't have any false balances, no inaccurate scales. What he calls good is good, and what he calls bad is bad. And what he says that needs to be judged and punished needs to be judged and punished. God is like this. So when he judges the world and all of its evil and sinfulness and crookedness and corruption and all of that, as we have described here, it is right. It takes it a step further and reminds us what we've seen many times, that the world has often treated God and God's people wrongly. Look at the end of verse 2. Who corrupted the earth with her immorality and has avenged on her the blood of his servants. The Bible teaches us that we do not get revenge on people because there's coming a day where God will be the one who takes out his vengeance. We do not retaliate. It's not the way of the Christian. We don't do that. Because the Bible says, make no mistake about it, the day is coming where God will do that. Vengeance is mine, declares the Lord. Here, in the end, in the rejoicing of heaven, we will see his justice, and he will be worshipped in heaven for his justice. He rightly condemns evil. He rightly takes out his vengeance on those who have treated God and, and God's people wrongly. To oppose God's people is to oppose God. Not this Friday, but last Friday when we did the football dinner, I read to them and told them the story of David and Goliath. Many of them had never heard the story of David and Goliath before. before. And I was reminded in telling them that story, and, and I had to tell them that we're often wrong when it's like one of the teams is this great, big, awesome team, and the other team is this little weak team. That's not what's going on there. And if you know the story of David and Goliath, that's a, that's a bad metaphor that's often used. God's the centerpiece of this. And the key part of the story is that David is upset at how Goliath, therefore, talks about God. That's the great part of the story. David's like, what's, what's wrong with all of you people? Y'all not bothered that he talks about God this way? Oh, y'all are scared, like God can't defend himself. Y'all just going to let him keep talking bad about God. That's what the issue is with David. And so we see that to oppose God is to oppose his people. And to oppose his people is to oppose God. And here in heaven, they're rejoicing because God is going to finally bring that about. The vengeance on it. It's been a while since we came through the early chapters of Revelation. But if you'll turn back to chapter 6... That's where the seven seals were, okay? But I want to show you this on the fifth one because it felt so heavy at the time, and I think you've forgotten it. Chapter 6, verse 9, the fifth seal. Chapter 6, verse 9, when he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the witness they had borne. 
They cried out with a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long? Does everybody see that question? How long before you will judge? Everybody see that? How long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? That is a question that church history has cried out for years. How long are God and his people going to be treated like this and opposed like this and persecuted and martyred and beaten and killed? How long, God, are you going to allow this before everybody knows you're true and worthy? How much longer that prayer, that cry comes out? You might remember the answer. Look at verse 11. Then, the, then they were each given a white robe and told to rest a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brothers should be complete who were to be killed as they themselves had been. The answer at the fifth seal in the sixth chapter of Revelation was not the best answer from those who are suffering. That question was how much longer And he said, a little bit longer. But guess what we see in chapter 19? The cry of the redeemed throughout church history. The cry that says, how much longer, God, till you judge? How much longer? And in chapter 19, the wait is over. The holy and true and just God has come. And he rightly and truthfully is judging the world. And this chapter is about his rejoicing. Now I want to show you something. You stay on the same page, but at chapter 18, we didn't even, I didn't even point this out last week because we covered such a huge section. At chapter 18, look at verse 21. For me, it's the same page. Then a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and he threw it into the sea saying... So will Babylon, the great city, be thrown down with violence and will be found no more. Now look at verse 22. And the sound of harpists and musicians, of flute players and trumpeters, will be heard in you no more. And a craftsman of any craft will be found in you no more. And the sound of the mill will be heard in you no more. All the noise that the world can make for whatever they're about will be silenced one day. In that day, it'll be quiet until the loud, boisterous rejoicing of chapter 19. In heaven, God is worshiped for his justice. And this final ending is just that, final. Look at verse 3. Once more they cried out, hallelujah, the smoke from her goes up, look at this, forever and ever. The world's judgment will be final. The world will never rise again. Her reign will be over. Verse 4 tells us everything in heaven will recognize this. All will join in on the praise of God for his justice. Verse 4 says the 24 elders, the four living creatures, all say hallelujah. Number one, in heaven God is worshipped for his justice. Every time you feel It shouldn't be like this. That's not right. They don't deserve that. It's not fair. That's not good. That's inaccurate. Every time you observe injustice and things not being the way God had created to be, may your heart recognize the brokenness that is in this world, and may you set your thoughts towards the God that will one day soon make it right. May you be reminded and even strengthened That in heaven we will worship God for his complete justice. But there's much more rejoicing going on in this chapter. Number two, in heaven, God is worshiped for his kingship. 
in heaven, God is worshipped for his kingship. You already know this point, but we have to say it again because it's here and it's so clear. All of Revelation has been showing this. Chapter 4, like, thrust us into the scene of the throne in the center of the whole universe. What a picture. I've not forgotten that. I hope that y'all still think about that too. Chapter 4 and chapter 5 showed us a throne in the center of the entire universe. He is that preeminent. He is that huge. He is that important. Jesus Christ is. And in heaven he will be worshipped for his kingship. Verse 5 says, from the throne came a voice saying, praise our God, all you his servants. Look at this next little phrase. You who fear him small and great. That's a nice expression, isn't it? No big words there. It's a simple, simple little thought. It actually comes out of the Psalms. That phrase, small and great, is originally found in the Psalms, but it's picked up on here. But it's a cool thought. Because God is so big and so great and so holy and worthy that no matter who you are, no matter how many trophies you got or awards you got, no matter how much money or success you have, no matter how much fame and attention you have, he's the king. And that will be totally understood in heaven. You think you're great? He's your king. You think you're small and you got nothing? He's your king. You think you're real significant? He's the king. You think you're insignificant? He's the king. And in heaven, that will be so clear. There won't be any caste system in heaven. There won't be any east end, south end, west end in heaven, right? There won't be anything like that. There won't be good schools and bad schools. There won't be elite and there won't be poor. It'll be people and their king. And we'll worship him that way. We will like it that way. If you get into verse 6, it says, Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters, like the sound of mighty peals of thunder. Again, this is loud. This is, this is like an unreal scene, crying out, Hallelujah. And look what they say in that first line of the second half of verse 6. For the Lord our God, the Almighty, reigns. Heaven will make no mistake about it, that this is about King Jesus. We will worship in heaven, not because it's everything we've desired, not because it's our favorite things. And over the course of our study in Revelation, we've hit on that a couple times, right? People ask, will we we play football in heaven, and will we have tacos in heaven, and will we have our pets in heaven, right? People love to have those conversations, right? And I, I don't have any answers to those. But what will be so clear is that we will be the happiest we've ever been, and we will know for certain that it's because of King Jesus. Those things are so true. And I really don't think you'll care if they have tacos or pizza or whatever it is, right, barbecue, whatever is your favorite. I don't think you're going to care as much. You're going to be so wrapped up in this heavenly experience that lasts forever. He saved me. I shouldn't be here. He loves me. I'm forgiven. It's going to be so good. It's going to be such a celebration. And you're going to recognize that he's your king. Jesus sits on the throne of heaven. And he reigns. Heaven recognizes that. But we are not to be people tucked away here in Louisville, Kentucky that read passages like this and kind of think in our little religious, kind of disconnected experience, yeah, he's a king and he reigns. If he's a king that reigns truly and he has a kingdom, which he does, then you and I better be experiencing that right now, that he reigns in your heart and your life. That he's the one that rules over your passions. That his leadership in your life brings peace and comfort and forgiveness and understanding. He's not only going to be the king that day in heaven, but he is the king right now. He is truly the king of kings. And he is your king. When you trust in Christ, and when we believe in him, we are welcomed into the kingdom. And what that looks like in our daily lives is walking by faith, trusting the Lord with all your heart. Through the highs and the lows, the ups and the downs, believing him. Jesus reigning 
and being worshipped for that will happen in heaven, but it is also happening now when you truly believe. I was reminded of that yesterday. In many ways, as we were here gathered in this room for the funeral for Mr. Stanley Harden, and we sang three songs yesterday, and I don't know exactly who chose them, but I'm thinking that Miss Tish did. And one of the songs that she chose is from the, the old hymnal. It was 448, Just a Closer Walk with Thee. That's an old hymn. I hadn't heard it in a long time, and so uh, I was paying attention to it because I wanted to make sure that we were singing a good song there. And Miss Tish, I'm so thankful that you chose that song. You want a picture of Jesus being the king of heart and life? Listen to the first line of just a closer walk with thee. I am weak, but thou art strong. Jesus, keep me from all wrong. I'll be satisfied as long as I walk. Let me walk close to thee. If your heart thinks... I'm satisfied as long as Jesus walks with me. As you cry your eyes out at your husband's funeral, then the king of kings on the throne of eternity must be doing something in you. Because that's not, no, that's not the normal worldly response to say, Jesus, I'm satisfied as long as you walk close with me. What a response. Miss Tish, thank you for that song, and I want you to know that even yesterday as I sat there, nervous as I can ever get to be a part of that service, God ministered to my heart about the kingship of Christ and how much he does reign. He will reign over it all one day, and he reigns in people's hearts right now. In heaven, we will worship him for the royal king that he is. May you worship him now as king over your life. That he is what matters most to you. Number one, in heaven God is worshipped for his justice. Number two, in heaven God is worshipped for his kingship. Number three, what a beautiful turn this is. Number three, in heaven God is worshipped for his bride's salvation. This is the first time that we really start to hear about the, the, the bridegroom analogy in the book of Revelation. But we've been hearing about it, right? The Bible talks about that in other places. Ephesians 5's got the big passage, right? This mystery is profound, and I'm saying that it refers to Christ in the church, right? The way a husband loves his wife and the way a wife loves her husband. That, that's a picture of the way Jesus is with his people. You've got this same language in the Old Testament a little bit, that the, that the people of Israel are the bride of Christ. This comes up here in chapter 19, beginning in verse 6. Uh, it, it changes directions. It's still the rejoicing in heaven, but it starts to use this analogy. Look at verse 7, actually. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come. Does everybody see that? The marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. Wow. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. For the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. Verse 9, and the angel said to me, write this. Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. In heaven, in the end, the rejoicing will be a marriage. And a supper at that marriage. What a beautiful, beautiful Scene. You know that weddings are nice. You know they are. Weddings are so nice, and so often there's a lot that goes into it. There's a lot of preparation. These days, there's a lot of money spent, right? There's a lot that goes into it. And so, perhaps as much as anything that we do that is a cause for celebration, a wedding, a marriage ceremony is a grand analogy from God of what will happen in the end when Christ the groom unites with his people, the church, his bride. When that finally comes together in the end and evil's been done away with and salvation is now full and the new heavens and the new earth are set up and the kingdom is here, the kingdom that we so often pray for, thy kingdom come. When that is here, that marriage will be a beautiful thing and it's the cause for 
rejoicing. Shriner speaks about how beautiful this is. He says, believers are told to rejoice and exult and glorify God because the wedding of the Lamb is at hand. One of the remarkable features of this section is the irrepressible gladness bursting through the text. It's hard to imagine anything more joyful than a wedding. And this is the wedding of all weddings. Everybody hear that? Revelation 19 is the wedding of all weddings. Indeed, all other marriages are modeled after Christ's relationship with the church. That's true. We have been prepared for this. For Yahweh's relationship to Israel is also explained in terms of bride and groom. We see that in Isaiah and Jeremiah, Ezekiel and Hosea. The wedding of the Lamb represents the consummation of God's purpose in history. Signifying his desire to be in relationship with human beings. What an incredible analogy that God chooses to use. A wedding A marriage? Is there anything more incredible in the life of a man than standing in front of a crowd when his one is chosen one starts to walk down the aisle in the most expensive dress they'll ever buy and the most makeup she'll ever wear? I've stood right here many a times when those doors have opened And the guy beside me is crying, and I'm crying, and everybody in here is like, this is the happiest day of their lives. And that's the beautiful analogy that God uses for what he's doing now in your life, and it will climax ultimately in that day. This is what we're reading about. That day is coming. We will worship him because he is going to so love you and unite with you and take care of you forever like we picture at a wedding and a marriage. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. On April 2nd, 2005, I was 25 years old. We got married in Gastonia, North Carolina. And I still think that was one of the happiest days of my life. I've got a CD disc of it. I love to go back and look at the pictures. I felt like I was skinny as a rail then. But I'm telling you, Valeria coming down the aisle in that dress, I was so ready for the minister to say, you may kiss your bride. That was an awesome day. I had like six groomsmen. She had six bridesmaids. All of my family was there. All of her family was there. We had a lot of family come from Ecuador. We brought 300 roses from Ecuador. It was an amazing celebration. It was one of the best days of our lives. We remember it so well. She looked so pretty. All of our friends were there. It was awesome. Till the day I die, I will think about just how awesome that day was. Everybody that loved us in that moment had come to cheer and to clap and to smile and just be happy for us. Weddings are like that. You know that they are. Many of you all sit here today. We've got lots of new young people that have gotten married recently. They remember that. They love their pictures. They can't wait to post those pictures on Facebook just for everybody to see how beautiful they looked and how meaningful that day was. And this is the analogy that God uses for what he's doing in us. We will worship in heaven saying, that's our Savior. That's the one that loves us. That's the one that went to the cross. That's the one that gave his life for us. He loves us. He wants us. He wants us to be his bride, his people. That's it. So then we get to this little section at the end, verse, verse, verse 9 And and this is odd. Even the commentators say that this is odd. The angel said, hey, write this down. Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. That's not odd. We get that, right? Hey, whoever makes it to that, they are blessed, right? There's a theme in Revelation. I talked about this heavy at the beginning. There are only seven times in Revelation where the word blessed is used. Seven blessings. They call them the Beatitudes. They call them the Beatitudes of Revelation. Seven times in Revelation, you have the word blessed. This is one of them. Here is what's blessed. If you get invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb for you to be married to the groom, you are blessed. And we get that. But here's what's neat. He said to me, these are the true words of God. That's odd, isn't it? Well, we knew that. Didn't we know that? Didn't John know that especially? 
We're 19 chapters in, John. Don't you know that this whole thing's coming from God? Listen what Shriner writes. The promises here are so great and stunning and so different from life on earth with its sorrows and sufferings that we need to be assured that they are true. They will become a reality. This chapter seems so far-fetched from the lives we're living that the angel says, write this down. These are the true words of God so that every doubt you have will be answered in the truthfulness of God, making a people to be his bride forever through the living Christ. May that comfort you. When I asked at the beginning, when is the last time that you were so extremely happy One of them was weddings that we have attended, or or at least some of them are weddings that we have attended. In heaven, God is worshipped for his bride's salvation. If you will believe that Christ is your only hope for salvation, and you will ask him to forgive you of your sins, you will be his bride. It's not complicated. You become his bride and a part of his bride by trusting that you cannot save yourself, but that he will welcome you in through faith. Not by being good enough, but by believing, by trusting. Lastly, number four, in heaven, God alone is worshiped. There is such clarity on this in the Bible. It is so exclusive in the Bible. There is only one God, and he alone is deserving of our worship. The first commandment of the Ten Commandments makes sure you know this. No other gods. And in heaven, it will be specifically clear. Look at our final verse today, verse 10, and we're done. Then I fell down at his feet to worship him, but he said to me, you must not do that. And and I'm going to be honest, I, I struggle so much with this. The guy writing the book of Revelation is the apostle John. And out of the 12 apostles, he's like the most solid of all. He's the disciple that Jesus loved. John and Peter are like the leaders of the disciples. He's the guy that wrote the Gospel of John. That's like the best book in the Bible. He's the guy that wrote 1 John, 2nd and 3rd John. He's the guy that is now writing Revelation, right? He is a hero in the faith, the Apostle John. And we're at the very end of this. He's at the end of his life. He's about to die. He's on an island to die, John is. We're at the end of the Bible, right? If he's ever learned anything, he's learned it now at this point. And on the Second to last page of my Bible in the very final season of John's life, he's ready to fall down and worship something other than God. What mercy God has for us, right? And he wasn't sent to hell for it. He wasn't judged for it because Christ had already been judged for him. John falls down to worship a messenger. Man, everybody knows that it's not the messenger, it's the message. We know that here. It's never the messenger, it's the message. You don't worship the one that tells you about God's grace for you. You worship the one that has grace for you. You don't worship the person that tells you that Jesus died on the cross for your sins and you don't have to face the judgment. You worship the one that died on the cross for your sins so that you don't have to face the judgment. John falls down and worships this angel. But praise the Lord, the angel knows. And that's what we see throughout Scripture, isn't it? The angels know what's up. They're different from humans. Humans don't become angels, and angels don't become humans. But the angels know. Man, they know. They got an angle other than us, but they know. 
And immediately, John, the apostle John, our hero John, falls down to worship this angel because of how beautiful the scene is, the rejoicing in heaven, the marriage supper of the Lamb. Now, granted, I can understand how John was just blown away by all of this goodness, right? Both small and great, right? A multitude that nobody can number. Remember, 19 goes with 17 and 18. So he's just seen all of the evil and crookedness in the world uh, uh, condemned and judged. The smoke goes up forever and ever, the burning in that wrath of God. And then he sees rejoicing of all of the love of God and the mercy of God and the true justness of God. John is seeing all of that, and he's ready to worship, so he worships the angel. But the angel says there, you must not do that. Don't. What are you doing? Get up. I'm a fellow servant with you and your brothers who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Doesn't get more clear than that. And then, In a two-word summary of the whole book of Revelation. In a two-word summary of the whole New Testament. In a two-word summary of the whole 66 books of the Bible. In a two-word summary for every day of your life, for every purpose of your home and your marriage and your children. A two-word summary to take you all the way to the end. Worship God. What a beautiful, hey, some people say the Bible's complicated, right? Some people say it's boring. Some people say it's hard to understand. But if you could ever wiggle your way through far enough to chapter 19, I'm not confused about that. Don't worship me. Worship God, the angel told John. He didn't tell John that he's okay. He didn't tell John he was good enough. He didn't tell John that he, you know, better than everybody else. So you're, if anybody's getting in, you're getting in. He taught him the two-word calling that is the calling for everybody, worship God. And then he says, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. That's some weird language that we don't often use, but here's what it means. The testimony of Jesus is the message from God. Jesus saves. He died on the cross for our sins. In heaven, God alone will be worshipped. In heaven, God is worshipped for his bride's salvation. In heaven, God is worshipped for his kingship. And in heaven, God is worshipped for his justice. May we be ready for heaven. This week, I got a new kid's book. You know, I'm always showing you all about the kid's books. This is a new one, just came out this year. It's by Nancy Guthrie. She's an awesome author. She's a teacher. God's using her a lot it's called The True King. It's a little book. You can get it. It's published by 10 of those. Wasn't expensive, really simple. It's got great illustrations. I just want to read you the first page and the last page. There are lots of books that tell stories about kings and kingdoms, princes and princesses. But there's just one problem with all of these stories. They aren't true. They are nice stories, but they're not true stories. There is one book, however, that tells a grand story about a king and a kingdom. That is the truest story ever told. This is the story of the true king who rules over his people in perfect goodness, in a kingdom that will last forever. This is the story of the Bible. This is the story, or the story, this story doesn't begin with once upon a time. Instead, it begins at the very beginning of time. That was the first page. And I want to read to you the last page. There is only one kingdom that proves true. One kingdom that will last forever. One kingdom with a king who is able to reign over this world and in our hearts forever. We long for our true king to come. So we pray to the great king, our father in heaven. May your name be honored. And may your kingdom come. May Revelation 19 point us to this great truth. God will be worshipped. His son Jesus is our king. May we be certain of it. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we worship you this morning. And we want to make sure that we are worshiping you now and that we will worship you forever. We thank you for the salvation that there is in Christ. He is the king. Father, may we make arrangements now 
for you to be king over us, king in our hearts, king over our lives. Father, lead us to repent of our sins. Lead us to faith and embracing of Jesus as the leader of our lives. Work in us now, we ask. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we sing this final song today, we want to have a time of response.